Welcome to the Growing Field Peas in 2019 webinar. My name is Prue Cook. I work with the Birchip Cropping Group and I also coordinate the GRDC funded Southern Pulse Extension Project. This project is delivered by a consortium of researchers, agronomists, farming systems groups, growers and pulse experts to increase the knowledge of growers and advisors on sustainable pulse production, improving the Southern region's capacity to maximise future growth and profitability opportunities. The purpose of today's webinar is to give new and existing field pea growers a snappy overview of what to consider this season to best set you up for success. Before we start the presentation, just some quick housekeeping on the webinar software. I've muted everyone's microphones, so please keep yourself on mute so that there's no background noise that might distract the presenters. We'll have a question and answer session at the end of today, but please feel free to submit a question at any time. The questions that get in first will be asked first. To ask a question, you should see a little speech bubble icon at the bottom of your screen. If you hit that, a chat box will appear and you'll be able to type in a message. You can either send that to everyone or if you would like your question to be anonymous, just make sure you send it to Birch of Cropping Group. Now this webinar is being recorded if you can't stay for the whole thing, or if you have any technical issues, or if you would like to share this with any colleagues or peers, then the recordings will be made available on the GRDC website next week. But if you would like access before that, please send me an email. My contact details will be provided at the end of this, and I can get you an earlier version. Now to help our presenters, I've just prepared two quick poll questions that I'd like to answer you, which will give us a bit of a gauge on who's joining us today. So hopefully you should see pop popping up on your screen. If you ha can't see it, you'll get a little bit of a get out of jail free card there and can just sit for a moment. But if you could, if you can see those questions, we just want to find out what your experience with growing field peas are and where you're dialing in from today. So I'll just give you a moment to hit the button there. <clears throat> so we've got quite a few agronomists and quite a few in the miscellaneous category who are joining us today. Lots of agronomists. Beautiful. So some from the upper EP and upper north, uh, some from lower EP in York, uh, quite a few from Wimra in central Victoria, one from northeast, and a couple from outside of the GRDC southern region. I'll leave that poll open for a little bit longer. Um, just to get those last bits in. So yes, overwhelmingly agronomists today, um, but a pretty good spread from right across the southern region and a few from outside the GRDC southern region. Just going to close that poll now. And what we'll do, let's get stuck straight into today's content. So I'm going to share my screen. And today we're going to kick off uh, with a presentation from Sarah Day. Now, Sarah works with Sadi out of the Clare Research Centre and her main research is in relation to pulse agronomy with a particular focus on low rainfall pulse production in Southern Australia. Sarah, I am going to turn your microphone on. There we go, and you're good to go. All right, thank you very much for that, Prue, and welcome to everyone who's joined today. Um, if you could just yeah go to my second slide, Prue, that would be good. Brilliant. All right, so to start with, I thought we'd take a look back at what happened in 2018 and what we can learn from the season. Um, one key learning from 2018 for field pea was to avoid high-risk frost areas. Field pea are highly sensitive to frost and in particular as they tend to flower and pod set earlier than other pulse species. Um, at the pulse validation site near Pinaroo, although biomass production for field pea was greater than two tonne a hectare, uh, the field pea plots were badly affected by spring frost events following eight nights when temperatures dropped below zero degrees Celsius in September. And as a result of this, there was no grain harvested from these field pea plots. Um, a pulse breeding Australia evaluation site that was located near Kadena um, also experienced another a number of frost events from
from June to September. And as you could see from the photos on the slide, the pods are very badly affected um, and the seeds turned black. And for this reason, we didn't harvest this trial. Aside from the frost risk that we saw or, and the damage that we saw in 2018, the dry seasonal conditions helped to show field pea continuing to express their yield and biomass, biomass stability in lower rainfall seasons and environments compared to other pulse species. The versatility and high biomass production potential of field pea can provide alternative end use options to grain production such as hay and have the potential to recover a financial return in drought or frost affected crops. The grain yields were fairly variable for uh, field pea across the southern region with the variable rainfall conditions that were experienced. Some of the yields ranged from 0.32 tonne a hectare at Kimber and 0.74 tonne at Minipa on the Upper Air Peninsula to 0.85 tonne at Balaclava, uh, 2.4 3 tonne a hectare at Riverton in the Bid North, 0.79 tonne at Lamaru in the Mallee and 2.85 tonne per hectare um, at Mandala in the southeast. So generally grain yields were low and those who managed to avoid the frost events seemed to fare the best in 2018. Uh, next slide please. So some, I thought I'd go through some key considerations for um, coming into the 2019 season. And some of those include paddock selection and variety selection. For paddock selection, there are a number of factors that need to be considered. Um, firstly, your soil type. Field peas are grown successfully on a wide range of soil types, varying from sandy loams through to clays and a pH of six to nine. Field pea do not tolerate waterlogging or salinity and are not suited to production on acidic or sandy duplex soils. Now, surface rolling can be utilised to improve the suitability of a paddock um, if rocks and stones are an issue, as this will leave a flatter surface and, in, and provide improved harvestability. Um, rolling for field pea is often done post-sowing pre-emergent. It is also important to choose a paddock not sown in the previous four years to field pea and ensure that the paddock is downwind from last year's pea stubble so as to avoid black spot risk and infection. Um, dry conditions in most regions is likely to reduce the infection potential uh, and disease levels were relatively low in 2018. Uh, select a paddock with few problem weeds in particular broadleaf weeds, and varieties with poor early vigour will have less ability to compete with weeds. And it's important to ensure um, maximum plant back period satisfied and that you won't run into any herbicide residue issues, in particular sulfonuria residues. Um, and also consider your frost risk and avoid sowing field pea in frost prone or low lying areas if you can avoid it. And then variety selection. So when selecting varieties, there are a number of considerations, such as what markets that you're trying to aim for, um, why are you producing field pea and what are you producing them for? Is it grain or is it forage production? And what disease traits do you require for your region? Uh, when will you sow field pea and would that fit into the rest of the sowing program? And your harvesting equipment. Will you be able to harvest a variety that falls over and lodges at maturity or do you require a variety that has lodging resistance? All of the latest variety information is available to growers and advisors um, through your state crop sowing guide as well as GRDC Grow Notes 
Pulse Australia website and other online resources. And next slide. So further considerations for growing field pea include crop establishment, disease risk, markets, and end use options. For crop establishment, there are a number of factors to consider. Firstly, time of sowing, which is often a compromise between avoiding increased frost risk from early sowing and yield loss from later sowing due to high temperatures and or dry conditions at flowering and pod fill. It is also important to consider how the sowing time of field pea fits back into the rest of your sowing program. Um, field pea can be sown dry and often sown at different times um, to other crop species. The figure that I've put on the slide um, shows the optimum sowing times for southern Australia. And this figure can also be found on the GRDC Grow Notes and Field Pea Ute Guides for further reference. Field pea should be grown at a depth of three to five, uh, sown at a depth of three to five centimetres with a sowing rate of 85 to 130 kilograms of seed per hectare. Sowing rate will differ slightly depending on what seed size it is, uh, the likely emergence and plant density required. Targeted densities tend to be lower with earlier sowing and higher for later sowing or if sowing onto hard setting soils or if the variety is of short um, to medium height and poor early vigour. Inoculation of seed is recommended, um, particularly if field pea have not been previously grown or if soil rhizobia levels are low um, or if the soil is slightly acidic. There are uh, a number of different inoculum types that can be used, including peat, uh, freeze-dried or granular forms. Fungicide seed dressings such as pea pickle tea and apron can be used as part of an integrated um, disease management strategy and where disease risk is high. It's also really important to ensure there is access and availability of local markets depending on your seed type that you're going to grow as white and blue field pea types are not accepted in the bulk done segregation. And this is something that needs to be taken into consideration when you're selecting the variety as well. And next slide. And just to finish up, what are the five top things to get right for successful field pea crop? Number one, paddock selection and location. If you can get this right at the beginning, this can influence a number of other factors. Uh, number two, avoiding herbicide damage and residues. Herbicide residues are likely to be an issue in 2019, in particular where there have been uh, limited rainfall over the spring and summer months. Number three, time of sowing. Again, to go over the point I mentioned earlier, to avoid frost and or dry conditions and high temperatures later on in the season. Number four is weed control. Um, a wide range of pre-emergent and early post-emergent herbicides are available for grass weed control in field pea. Broadleaf weeds, um, there are more limited post-emergent options for broadleaf weeds, but these include metribuzin, Imazimox, Diflufenicin, and Flumetsalum. And also crop topping is a suitable option in field pea um, to control grass weeds and in particular ryegrass. And number five, lastly, is disease risk, or disease control, sorry, I should have written on this. Um, and on that note, I will thank you all for joining and pass back to Prue.
Thank you very much for that, Sarah, much appreciated. And now to delve into disease risk a little bit more, I'd like to introduce you all to Joshua Fanning. Josh is from Agriculture Victoria, based in Horsham, and is a pulse pathologist supporting the pulse industry with disease management through field-based research and extension. Josh, your microphone is on, over to you. Thanks, Prue. Um, we can probably go straight on to the next slide. Um, so a lot of the data that I present today has been collected by the Southern Pulse Agronomy Program and um, across some of the trials last year that what I've been working since I started on pulse pathology last year. So black spot in field peas is probably the biggest issue that we sort of talk about, especially in Victoria. The mildews in South Australia, I don't know a huge amount, um, which are also issues over there. Um, so I'll probably just go through, or I will go through black spot and bacterial blight, which seems to be a bit topical at the moment. Um, so black spot, I've got some images there on the screen um, of what black spot looks like. It's a disease complex. There's a number of pathogens involved in it. Um, and which one doesn't really matter in terms of the management that we recommend for black spot. Um, so if you go on to the next slide, Prue. Um, this slide here shows a graph of grain yield against variety. Um, and we've got a fortnightly fungicide regime. Um, this was in a higher rainfall zone in um, 2015. And it's comparing that fortnightly fungicide regime, which we've never recommend in field peas compared to um, an untreated um, plot, um, which are our blue lines, and we can see there that every variety lost grain yield loss, and, the, and it varied from around that half a ton mark um, up to almost a ton in some location, um, in some varieties. Um, and we can see that, that so black spot does cause yield losses, and this was a dry season in 2015, but we're in the higher rainfall zone there, um, so it will be more typical of what we'd see in that sort of medium rainfall zone in some areas. The first thing to note is if you go across to the left a little bit, there are some varieties like PBA Pearl, which is rated MRMS. It offers a little bit more resistance to black spot, um, but otherwise we're relying on fungicides. Um, so if you go on to the next slide, Prue. Um, this graph here is a similar graph, but only four varieties and sort of four or three fungicide regimes that we um, tested in 2016 within the Southern Pulse Agronomy Program. So it's an average of four sites. And we can see here, and this, is a, this was a high rainfall season. Um, we had very good rainfall in 2016 across Victoria. And we can see here that the yield losses due to black spot of field peas were a lot less um, if you compare, say, that orange line on the right of each variety to the blue line on the left of each variety. Um, or blue bar on each variety. So we can see here that it, there's not huge yield losses due to black spot in every season, um, but there's a range of fungicide options that can be employed. Um, so there we've got prothioconazole and bixofen um, and um, mancozet. Um, so if we go on to the next slide, there's some recommendations around that. So with black spot in fungicides, it's about managing the economics. If it's a lower, lower disease risk season, so you're planting later, um, where there's a black spot manager that you can access um, that's put out by the Western Australian um, Department, which is at the end of my slide, a link to that, um, end of the presentation. Um, but usually we only need sort of two fungicide sprays, that one to two mark of fungicide sprays for black spot. So really take into account the value of the crop, what you're using the crop for, as Sarah suggested, um, and then tailor your disease management around that. Um, so if you're doing a manure, you probably don't need to do that. If you're not near another field pea crop or haven't grown field pea crops within that sort of 500 metre mark of this paddock, you're going to need less fungicides than what you are if you're going field pea on field pea, which I hope no one's doing, or in the paddock next door. Um, so the recommendation is usually an early control. If we keep it clean from the start, we're going to reduce that grain yield loss later in the season. So we usually go out with that four to eight node, four in a high disease pressure year, eight node normally, um, fungicide treatment, and then follow up at flowering to protect the seed um, or potting if definitely if required. But usually at that flowering stage is the best bet, keeping in mind with holding periods. So there's a range of products that can be used. I've, I've named a few down there um, that are all um, valuable tools in the shed. There's a lot of data around each of those presented by both SARDI and um, the Southern Pulse Agronomy Program. 
but Pulse Australia produce a very good fungicide guide each year and there's a link to that at the end of the presentation. So I'd be having a good look at that um, fungicide plan, basically that fungicide guide from Pulse Australia and that names what they're, what each active ingredient is is able to be used on um, from Ascopita bright, botrytis, powdery mildew and downy mildew and it also incorporates the current flat permits um, that are available for disease control as well as the registered products because um, those permits change from year to year. So next slide, Prue. Bacterial blight, I'll now move on to now. So on the left there we've got a picture of a field trial at Horsham last year showing one variety there that's almost lost total, well has lost total yield due to bacterial blight and on the right hand side we've got a picture of some preliminary symptoms of bacterial blight that we see. Now the predominant cause of bacterial blight um, is due to frost risk and then the bacteria cause those symptoms um, and result in grain yield loss. So the other place that it may, co may be caused by is mechanical damage to the crop. So if they're blowing up against stubble there's a higher risk but there's also a higher risk due to um, where the tra train tracks on your field or where your tractor's driving on your field. Um, so we can see bacterial blight radiate out from there but frost is our primary um, concern. Next slide, Prue. Now, the best way to control bacterial blight is through planting non-infected seed and then the other thing is to grow more resistant varieties. So this graph here was a variety trial that Jason Brand had last year in the Southern Pulse Agronomy Program that I assessed and if we look on the left hand axis or the y axis it goes from 0 to 100, that's the percentage of the plot affected. And then on the x-axis we've got a range of varieties that were within that trial from breeding programs to our most resistant variety PBA Percy on the left hand side, a conventional type field pet. So we can see by moving from those varieties on the very right hand side to those varieties on the left we're getting a lot less bacterial blight infection. Now this was after several frost events. If we move on to the next slide Prue, the problem is this, those red lines are now after we've had, it's about a month, three weeks later and we've had multiple frost events in that time. So the disease has really progressed, we've had numerous frost events now um, and we're starting to lose a lot of that resistance. So in some seasons like last year in some areas where there was really high frost risk and a number of frosts for significant periods of time overnight, um, where st that resistance starts to break down um, and you basically haven't got um, those resistant varieties um, giving you control of those diseases um, for bacterial blight. So the best thing we can do is plant resistant seed, try and manage your frost with frost risk um, in best, as best you can, so not planting in really high frost risk areas, um, but really it's ensuring that your seed that you plant isn't infected with bacterial blight or the pathogen that causes bacterial blight um, pre-season. So next slide, Prue. Now the other thing, the next two slides are just going to mention some of the other diseases that we've been working on and other projects that we've been working on. So viruses, viruses are sort of go under the radar. I've been working in nematology for five years and in my nematode trials we've never tested for viruses. We see some symptomatic plants every now and again but it's something that sort of flies under the radar and no one really thinks about. I've listed a few there, so some seed borne viruses so that so they're still spread by aphids but they're able to be transmitted by the seed. So if you've got infected seed last year and move on to the following year this year, um, if you have those viruses you're planting um, infected seed so those viruses are going to be present in your fields this year. The other one is spread through aphids usually, so in season transmission and we've got a few viruses there um, listed. If we look at the graph on the right hand side, we're seeing 40% yield loss and that was due to turnip yellows virus. It was preliminary work that we did last year. So it's just to highlight that viruses can be an issue and it's probably something that you need to think about in your individual risk and are you having yield losses in your field. Um, and talk to your agronomist, how much, how, many, how much aphid activity have you had for the spread of viruses and do you think you're losing yield to it? Um, and there's seed, built, seed borne tests available to ensure those seed borne ones aren't transmitted and the others is just having an insecticide control program in place um, so that you can basically control your insect pests. Next slide Prue. 
soil-borne diseases, um, that's where I've come from and still working on a little bit on the side. Um, in field peas, we haven't seen too much. There's a number of soil-borne diseases on the left-hand side there that you can see, root lesion nematodes, pythium, rhizoctonia, that all affect field peas. Um, detection, the easiest way is to look at root disease assessments, but if you're really concerned about your paddocks, um, I would just recommend a predictor B test. On the right-hand side, that shows all the diseases um, or pathogens it's detecting for, and it gives you a nice little category there for risk. Um, if you haven't seen it, if it comes up as orange to red, then you can see that that's where your risk is. It's in that medium to high risk, but if it's green, it's all good, and you don't need to worry about it. The good thing about this test is it actually does a range of pathogens about across all crops, um, both pulses and cereals. Um, but it's really only there if you're seeing um, root disease symptoms or you think you've got those issues, and that's where I'd be recommending it. But if you've got good control options, um, good good ro crop rotation, sorry, um, it's not going to be that bigger issue. Um, the one to note there is there is a black spot risk, so you can actually detect your paddock that, um, for the black spot risk using the predictor B um, if that's of concern to you or you're in a high black spot risk prone area. Um, and then can use seed treatments to control those. Next slide, Prue. So just in summary, it's about growing resistant varieties. Um, if you can grow resistant varieties, you don't need to rely on fungicides as much. And in the case of bacterial blight, well, there's no fungicides that you can use in season. So a resistant variety is your best bet if you can, um, or controlling your frost risk. For fungicide use, particularly with black spot um, or even the mildews, follow the economics, follow the labels um, on your chemicals. And for black spot, usually one to two sprays are what's required normally. Um, in a really high disease pressure year, you might need a few more. Um, and test your seed for both bacterial blight and viruses. You don't want to be planting that infected seed right from the word go. Um, and I'll leave it there. Thank you. Um, I should mention those two resources, sorry. Um, so they're the two resources that you can use, Black Spot Manager and Pulse Australia. Um, that's a link to the field peak growing guide there, um, which is a very good resource. Great, thank you very much for that, Josh. Josh, that's a very comprehensive overview. Now, to finish up our webinar today, we're going to have a discussion around what's happening in markets in relation to field peas. And to help us out with that, we've got Francois Darkus, who operates his own pulse trading business, Agri Oz Exports, and brings a wealth of international trade experience. Francois, over to you. Okay, thank you. Uh... You can put the slides on. So I'd like to start uh, the next slide, uh, please. Yeah, just to a little bit of a perspective on where Australia fits in the world of uh, peas production. So we, in Australia, we're a fairly marginal producer and player in terms of the international market. Uh, as you can see on those numbers, our crop sizes vary between, say, on average, 200,000 tons and 400,000 tons, which was a bit of an outlier in 2016. Uh, if you compare that with what Canada grows, uh, they've reached almost 5 million tons in 2016, and on average are between 3 and 4 million. The US, around 700,000 tons. Uh, France, uh, 6 to 700,000 tons. Russia and Ukraine have been the, the big uh, growth factors in, in peace production in the last few years. You can see Russia going from 1.5 million to over 3 million in 2017, settling down a bit lower the last two years. Uh, and the Ukraine going from 359 in 2014 to over a million tons. Um, then the Indian production is actually not that large considering all the other purses um, that India grows, but peas in India are fairly small and marginal crop. Um, a lot of those peas grow, grow in, especially in, in Europe, so France, Russia, Ukraine, go into feed markets, although some of them more and more find their way into food markets in, uh, in the Indian subcontinent. Um, next slide, please. So field peas in Australia, as, as opposed to other purses like chickpeas, lentils, and fava beans, uh, 
tend to go 50-50 uh, domestic feed and, and domestic splitting and export markets where other prices like chickpeas, I would say, are probably 90% export, uh, lentils, same thing, 90-95% export. So depending on where you are located as a grower, uh, your options may be quite different. So what we're seeing is in Victoria, a large portion of the crop is actually staying in the domestic market, either going to feed meals or to splitting businesses such as uh, Ward McKenzie in, in Altona. Um, if you're in South Australia, less access to feed meals uh, and less access also to um, domestic splitting, so most peas there do go for exports. Uh, we also have a little bit of a crop in WA, but not very large, and that's mostly going for export. Now, the domestic demand is very variable, difficult to quantify because there are no official statistics. So you have a number of feed meals, a couple of companies buying peas for splitting, uh, for packaging into soups or food mixes. Uh, and that demand, uh, the feed demand especially, really demands, uh, varies with uh, relative prices of other proteins such as canola meal, soybean meal, which is imported. Other purses, uh, we saw in 2016 when we had a huge Faber crop and Faber prices got very low. Most feed mills switched from peas to Faber beans. So the that domestic demand can vary quite a lot depending on the season and, and relative prices of other products, and generally will be quite stronger in a dry year like we saw this year. Um, this year we are exporting hardly any peas from Victoria; they've all been consumed uh, domestically for feed. Uh, for the export demand, we do have hard numbers uh, in the form of um, customs data, which are published by the, the Australian Bureau of Statistics, uh, which allows us to track the export numbers. Um, next slide, please. So this table shows where our peas are normally exported to. Um, India, second row, is Normally, or I would say was normally our largest market by far. What's happened since last year is the Indian government has really put a lot of um, barriers to trade, uh, initially in the form of uh, import duties, and in the case of peas, a total ban on imports, which has really shrunk uh, the demand. Uh, this year, we would not have, in any case, the, the export tonnages we we would have required in past years due to the drought. But you can see that the Indian demand has really shrunk uh, you know, from a peak of 135 in 1617 when we had a large crop and, and cheap prices to virtually nothing this year. Uh, there are talks of the Indian market reopening after the election, which, coming, which is coming in uh, April, May. And also that will depend also uh, obviously on their crops which are harvesting now until April. Other than India, Bangladesh has become the, the most regular uh, market at around 20,000 tons a year. Malaysia has been stagnating for many years, around 10 to 15,000 tons a year. Um, Pakistan, not much. There was a little bit in 2016, again, because we had ample exports, availability, and cheap prices. Sri Lanka, we will see in another table. So this table is for whole peas exports. But Sri Lanka imports actually more peas in, in split form. Uh, China, until uh, 2016, could not import Australian peas. There was no uh, phytosanitary protocol between the, the two countries. That was fixed. And so China became uh, an importer in 1617 and again last year. A lot less this year, and that has to do with our prices, which are high. So, like most buyers, the Chinese are very price sensitive. And then I have a last row saying others. So, our peas find their ways to various small markets um, Mauritius, uh, Yemen, um, a little bit to Europe, but not accounting to very much. Um, next slide, please. 
So that's uh, a chart of the data from the, the previous slide. Uh, so the blue line is India. You can see uh, a very abrupt fall there uh, linked to their uh, protectionism uh, and, and the inability for importers to, to import. Um, all the other markets you can see are relatively stable and relatively of the same size. It was Bangladesh number one. Uh, China was equal to Bangladesh in 1617, but have uh, imported less since due to our higher prices. Um, next slide, please. So this table is a continuation. So that's the exports of uh, bees in split form. So we have several splitting companies, splitting businesses, in, in mostly in Victoria, who export uh, split peas, and as I said earlier, Sri Lanka is the main market, Bangladesh a little bit, Malaysia, Mauritius, Yemen. Uh, so not a huge market, but you have to apply a, a loss factor there. So if we export 30,000 tons of split peas, that's probably 45,000 tons of peas initially uh, after accounting for the, the loss in splitting. Uh, next slide, please. So Australian peas tend to be uh, more expensive than our international competition, be it Canada, USA, uh, Ukraine, Russia. Uh, we also don't grow uh, the same peas. Most of these countries grow yellow peas. We grow uh, traditional dun peas and, and the Caspa type, which has become very popular in the last 10 years. Um, so our peas go into niche markets. So this slide is about India, where India import our peas mostly into Southeast India, um, the Tamil Nadu area, the ports of Chittagong and Chennai, where the peas are split and then uh, roasted and, and coated sometimes in some sort of a spicy uh, coating and sold as snacks. So they're actually quite tasty. Um, and they are competing against chickpeas, chickpeas that are either grown locally in India, India can grow up to 10 million tons of chickpeas in a good year, um, or imported chickpeas from Australia. So we can place our peas there in Southeast India as long as they are quite cheaper than chickpeas, and then they take market away from chickpeas. After splitting and roasting, they look very much the same. Uh, the Indian consumer will, will say the, the chickpea tastes better, but anyway, so there's a, a sizable market, one where at the right price and one we have the availability for uh, or export. Uh, next slide, please. Yeah, so that's another slide about several brands of uh, split, uh, and, and they call them whole fry gram, and gram is a term for chickpeas in India. Uh, they actually not fried, they're roasted. The, the, the process is they split the peas, clean them, and then they go through a very hot oven for just a few seconds and uh, come out the other end. Um, next slide, please. Now China has appeared as a niche market also in the last two years. Uh, in China, they import our peas uh, to put them in a mix uh, as bird food. Chinese are very fond of uh, raising birds, and uh, so bird food is a big business there, and that's what our peas go for. Uh, if you compare our exports, 15 to 20,000 tons a year to China, the Canadians export 1.8 million tons to China, but a very different usage. Uh, the peas are used either for starch extraction, um, where they make vermicelli noodles uh, with the starch, Protein extraction, more and more uh, uh, bees are used for protein fractionation and then protein additives to, to other foods. And then feed peas. Uh, the feed pea consumption or imports in, in, in China grew a little bit in the last year with uh, trade wars or disputes between uh, China and the US. Soybeans imports dropped and in peas imports uh, grew a little bit then the Chinese are in a dispute of their own with the Canadians now, so that could change again. Um, so if you're looking for price guidance for the coming year, uh, I wouldn't have a, 
A very good crystal ball. As I said earlier, uh, P prices domestically are influenced by many, many factors. Uh, one of them is obviously the, the season. Uh, if it's dry and we are lacking feed grains or hay or grass in general, the feed pea consumption will increase in Australia and then keep the prices high, which in turn could prevent exports. Um, it also depends on, on the price of competing proteins, such as canola meal and soybean meal, and uh, just too many factors which make it very, very hard to forecast accurately the price. In terms of exports, uh, at the moment it's very hard to say much because of that restriction of access to India. We hope it will be lifted or at least uh, eased a little bit. Um, and then Export prices are somewhat uh, limited by the price of chickpeas with which we compete in India and the price of other peas uh, from other origins such as Canada, USA, Ukraine, Russia, which do put a lead on our prices. We, we tend to sell our peas into niche markets which pay premiums, but those premiums are not unlimited. So uh, we reach a point where uh, we just cannot export our peas if they get too expensive, and that happens in dry years when domestic demand is outbidding the export market. So that is all for me. Uh, happy to take questions later. Thank you, Francois. Much appreciated. All right. So that concludes all the formal presentations for today. So we can move into a Q&A session. I haven't received any questions in yet. But just a reminder, if you do want to ask a question of one of our three presenters, um, then please look for that speech icon, which I've outlined in red on your screen. Um, it should be at the top now. If you click over the top, you should be able to see it. Um, but it might appear slightly different depending on the device that you're coming in from. Uh, while I wait for some questions to come through, if you're looking for further information on field peace, the GRDC Grow Notes are an incredibly comprehensive resource and both Josh and Sarah outlined that earlier. Also, the GRDC Southern Pulse Extension Project, which this webinar is part of, will have a number of activities occurring through 2019 to continue bringing you the latest in pulse information. So we have a network of discussion groups across Victoria and South Australia called Pulse Check Groups and they're ideally targeting newer pulse growers. Um, if you're in one of the locations that you can see on your screen and you would like to get involved, you can send me an email. I'll provide my contact details at the end of this webinar and I'll get you in touch with the group coordinator in your local area. We'll also be having a series of crop walks at Southern Pulse Agronomy sites right across the region in late winter and spring. Uh, so please keep an eye on the GRDC events webpage for those details. Um, there's also more Pulse webinars this week. So there'll be one on lentils and one on chickpeas this Friday. Uh, so if you're interested in getting an in-depth look at either lentils or chickpeas, it'd be great if you can join us then on Friday. Um, if you also like today's event and you like the format, feel free to suggest other Pulse topics that you'd like covered and we can look at rolling out more throughout the year. I've just had a question come in, um, Sarah or Josh, it might be one for you. It's about storage tips for field peas. I'll unmute both of you if anyone has there. Otherwise, if we can't get an answer to that one, we're working closely with the GRDC Grain Storage Extension Program and can get some responses there. Josh or Sarah, do you, or, or Francois, do you want to comment on storage? Uh, sorry, I missed the, the, the detail of the question. Just any storage tips for field peas? Uh, from a technical point of view, no, I'm not the right person. Uh, if you're asking about storage options, uh, that's different. Um, but no, I, I wouldn't be a good advisor. <laughs> no, from either of those, sorry, Prue, that would, yeah, Sarah or Jason or probably the other team, yeah, the grain storage team in GRDC would probably be better, I would think. 
So Chris Warwick, who is a grain storage expert, is involved with the project. So um, that message has come to me privately, so I can put that person in touch with Chris Warwick and he can provide some advice on that particular question. Any other questions, feel free to get them in. Otherwise, looking at the time, um, please feel free to suggest any other topics you might like covered uh, through a webinar throughout the course of the year. Uh, another question, any work on breeding a more dual purpose field pea? <laughs> By dual purpose, I assume that is talking about um, yeah, grain and forage. Uh, if the original poster could uh, respond to that, if possible, please. Grain and forage, yes, correct. Yeah. I am somewhat involved in the breeding program. I'm not sure about what their aims are looking at something like that, but I do believe there are some breeding lines coming through the program um, that may suit, yeah, a dual purpose variety. But again, that's probably a question to the breeders. <laughs> I can follow up with that one as well too, not a problem. Just okay. on that note, the breeding program is very interested and if there's a market for that, um, then Gary and Babu are certainly um, very keen to take people's opinions and if there's a market, they're happy to work with those people to be able to um, breed a bill pea for that. So they've made that pretty clear in a lot of our meetings of late, so yeah, we can certainly pass that on. Thanks, Josh. And this is good. There's some potential questions that we might be able to cover in future webinars where we could drill into some in-depth pulse topics later in the growing season. I'm going to call it there. Um, so that brings today's webinar to a close. And so a great big thank you to all of our presenters and all of you for participating as well too. Very much appreciated and thank you for your questions. Um, with that, we'll close the webinar. Thank you again. Um, my contact details are on the screen now if anyone wants to touch base with, with me with any additional thoughts or comments. And I thank you again for your time today and I hope you all grow some magnificent pea crops this season. <laughs>